a marvel of an adventure story full of joy and wisdom. Hello and welcome to Liam's Lyceum. I'm your host, Liam, aka Hembar, and today I'll be doing a spoiler free review of Franz G. Benston's The Long Ships. Long Ships, also called Red Orm, is a 19, well, 54 novel in English by Franz G. Benston. It was originally, I believe, serialized in the 40s in Swedish. Um, the English translation, uh, or at least the popular one, is by Michael Mayer, or Meyer, and there is a popular introduction by Michael Chabon. Uh, this story uh, takes place from the years 980 to 1010 uh, AD, or CE. I guess, depending on how you want to look at that. So it is about a, well, man who goes a Viking uh, named Red Orm. And he's called Red Orm, uh, largely because of his red hair. Uh, we He is alive in the echoes of the Battle of um, <laughs> Sorry. Even though I, de- I know he's not Old Norse, I totally butchered that. That's a complicated word. And then the Battle of uh, Um But uh, he's he is the youngest son of a family. Uh, though all of his brothers are dead or uh, apparently not very impressive. The family lives in Scania, which is in southern Sweden, um, though at the time was part of uh, Denmark, uh, which I actually think is around the homeland of the Danes, to be completely honest. Um, but anyways, so so his name is just Orm. Uh, he's the son of Tosta, and at this point, um, he goes a Viking. And this story is actually about three voyages. We get to see the winds in the Baltic. Uh, We get the Rus, uh, French, Asturians, Moors, and the Caliphate of Cordoba, and even um, uh, the Viking Rus uh, and England, I think, as well, I guess I should mention. But uh, there is a Jewish character as well in the story. It's it's not a wretched caricature either. It's cool. Uh, But even cooler is it was written in the middle of World War II. So uh, there's also slavery, of course, and it's a stark part of reality for the time period. And we also get the rising popularity of Christianity among the pagan Vikings. In fact, every religion is, uh, well, actually cast in a rather good light. It's rather charitable, uh, the, the depictions, um, even of the Muslims, um, and not just the Jews as well, and the pagans even as well. So, for again, so it, it, there's not a ton of biases that I could really, could really spot. Um, and, well, our character Orm, he has some luck. Um, he's considered good for taking on voyages, though he's um, literally a seasick Viking at some points. And it's hard to describe in some ways, uh, since there's so much that happens. This is a, someone's life. It's a story of someone's life, right? It takes place over 30 years. And it's really like a, a saga because of that. It's Though it's fictional, of course. You know, it's a Viking story I'd never really heard about. I, I heard about it several times over the course of about one week. Um, Raph Blutax, who's actually who I'm quoting at the beginning, of this, so you should go check out Raf's video um, that he came out with uh, a couple years ago, I think now. Um, and then I mentioned, or I saw Howard Andrew Jones, who's an author, um, mention it, and then Centipede Press mentioned it in their um, weekly newsletter. So it's pretty cool, anyways, that I heard all these people mention it at the time. I was like, okay, I'm going to read this. But we do have historical figures like Harl Bluetooth and um, the ruler of Andalusia, which I'm really bad with his name, but that guy. Uh, there's even poetry. It's not really skaldic. Uh, maybe it is in Swedish. I'm not sure. Uh, it comes off as more English poetry here, uh, which again is lovely still that it's in verse. Uh, so maybe maybe it's more skaldic in Swedish. I don't really know what Swedish poetry is like, to be honest. Um, but we do also get to see like something historical like the Battle of Malden. Uh, and we do get to see King Ethelred and again, Harl Bluetooth. And then that one guy in Hallelujah. I think his name is Almansur, anyways. Um, we also have... Uh, the Magister, a, a rather a Magister from Aachen, uh, which is probably one of the more interesting characters. His tale is absolutely absurd. Um, and this is divided into four parts. It sometimes, or has been published in two volumes in the past. But honestly, there is something here for everyone. It's it's epic, has a great friendship, romance, so much. Honestly, it's, it's really good as far as Viking novels go. And it is a good length for most people. It is completely historical. It is not fantastical at all. But I do actually have a couple quotes from the Michael Chibon's, um introduction because it was very impressive and it summarizes a lot uh, more than, well, better than I, 
I can. So I'm just going to read some of that real quick. It says, The record of a series of three imaginary but plausible voyages, interrupted by a singular, uh, singularly eventful interlude of hanging around the house, undertaken by a crafty, resourceful, unsentimental, and mildly hypochondric, Dry a cold, sorry, Norseman named the Red Orm Totson or Totson. Uh, the long ships is itself a kind of novelistic Argus aboard which, like the heroes of a great age, all the strategies deployed by European novels over the course of the preceding century are united. If not for the first, then perhaps for the very last time. The the Dioscuri of nineteenth century realism, um, factual precision and mundane detail set sail on the long ships. Uh, with uh, nationalism, medievalism, and exoticism for shipmates, um, branching a banner of 19th century romance. But among the heroic crew mustered by Franz Bingston in his only work of fiction is an irony as harsh, forgiving as anything in Dickens, a wit and skepticism worthy of Stendhal, an epic Tolstoyan sense of the anti-epic, and the her her oh, wow, I cannot say this word, Heruculean, Heruculean, anyways, narrative, drive might and nimble of alexander dumas like half the great european novels the long ships is big bloody and far-ranging concerned with war and treasure and the grand deeds of men and kings like the other half it is intimate and domestic centered firmly around the sea um, the seasons and pursuits of village and farm around weddings and births around the hearths of women who see only too keenly through the grand pretensions of men and bloody kings and again, another quote from Chaban, or Chaban, I, I, I'm sorry, guys. Anyways, the antique chiming that stirs the air of the novel sentences without ever overpowering or choking that air with antique dust recalls the epics and chronicles and history our mother tongue, the history, after all, shared up to a point with the original Swedish, and the setting of parts of the action in Dark Ages Britain further strengthens the reader's deceptive sense that he or she is, thanks to the translator's magic and art, reading a work of English literature, tossing the novel's unceasing playfulness around the subject of Christianity and its virtues and shortcomings when compared to Islam and especially to the older religion of the Northern Forest, a playfulness that cannot disguise the author's profound but lightly worn concern with questions of ethics and the right use and purpose of a life, and the startling presence in a Swedish Viking story of a sympathetic Jewish character and of a work whose virtues and surprises ought long since to have given it a prominent place, at least in the pantheon of the world's adventure literature, if not world literature. Full stop. What else can I say? So that is a, a great reason to go read it, I think, all, all that has been said. So anyways, I'll link Graf's video below, and this has been Leo Williams Lyceum. I'll catch you next time.